for joining us. Well, it was the deadliest wave of terror to hit Israel in years. Three attacks in eight days have left 11 people dead. In Gaza and Lebanon, Hamas and Hezbollah celebrated the murders of Israeli citizens. In a speech to the nation, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett declared Israel will triumph over terror. Chris Mitchell has the latest. On Tuesday night, a Palestinian gunman on a motorcycle opened fire in the crowded central city of B'nai Brak, killing five Israelis, including an Arab policeman. Israeli police said they managed to shoot the terrorists and prevent more deaths. It was the second mass shooting in days. ISIS claimed responsibility for an attack in the city of Hadera, where two Palestinian Arabs killed two and wounded four. Earlier, an ISIS supporter killed four in a stabbing spree in the southern city of Besheva that left four dead. In the past week, thousands of Israelis gathered in funerals around the country. Hundreds mourned a 19-year-old border policewoman killed in one attack, and Israel's education minister lamented the victims of another. Four human beings who went out on their daily routine were brutally murdered in a murder campaign of a bloodthirsty murderer only for the reason of them being Jewish. To address the wave of violence, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett called an emergency meeting of top security officials and in a nationwide speech, he told Israelis that Israel would prevail over terror. <laughs> We face a challenging period. We have experience in dealing with terrorism from the very beginning of Zionism. They did not break us then, and they will not break us now. Hamas praised the shootings in B'nai Brak as a heroic operation. And on Twitter, some in Gaza passed out candy to celebrate the killings. Hezbollah supporters in Lebanon danced in the streets and waved flags to celebrate the latest attack. The terror attacks come ahead of the Muslim month of Ramadan, where there is often a rise in terrorism. Millions of Muslims actually enjoy the, the holiday peacefully. But here in Israel, unfortunately, we have radical forces who take advantage of this uh, important religious holiday to incite against Jews and to promote violence. A new Palestinian study revealed sobering findings about the future of Israeli-Palestinian relations. Nearly half of Palestinians polled said the most effective way to build an independent state was, quote, armed struggle. Only 25% chose negotiations. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, we've been saying on this program for decades, not just years, but decades, that you can't have peace with a radicalized group that wants to kill you. And here we're seeing proof yet again that you can't have peace with people that want to murder Jews, that's the, the end game here. When they say it's armed struggle uh, is the only way, they're saying something that they've said for over 70 years, that they want to drive Israel into the sea. They want to exterminate all the Jews in, in, in Israel. How can you ever get to a peaceful two-state solution when you have that on the other side, they have no intention of building a state. They have no intention of building their own society, benefiting their own children and grandchildren. Uh, they're dedicated to wiping out the Jews. Now, let me remind you of another celebration these same people had, and it was 9-11. Now, it's 21 years but they celebrated in the streets. They danced in the streets when the tr Twin Towers came down. Let us never forget that. And so we cannot possibly say, well, let's put them more money into that, or let's try to open an embassy to that. Uh, it just makes no sense to me that people in power in our State Department somehow think that they can come to a peace agreement with them, somehow think that they can come to a two-state solution with them, Sometimes, somehow think that it's really good idea to send taxpayer dollars to them so that they can in turn fund terror and fund martyr payments and all the other things that are well publicized and well known. Uh, this needs to shut down. We need to stop enabling them to do more terror acts. In other news, the FDA authorized a second COVID booster for people over 50 years old. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson joins us now for more. So, Lori, 
Why did they draw the line at 50 and over? And does this mean that everyone that age should get the extra booster shot? Well, Gordon, we know that age is the number one risk factor for severe disease or death. And originally, they were going to uh, authorize this second booster just for people over the age of 65. But the second leading risk factor is obesity. And one third of people between the ages of 50 and 65 are obese and also suffer from other risk factors. So that's why they lowered it down to 50. But the big takeaway from this action is that the FDA authorized a second booster, but stopped short of actually recommending it. So what that means is that people should decide for themselves, preferably in consultation with their doctor, if a second booster is right for them. Federal officials say that, based on modeling, if we have another surge, a second booster could save thousands of lives and prevent tens of thousands of hospitalizations. We know, Gordon, that during the Omicron surge, people who were boosted were 21 times less likely to die than people who were unvaccinated. And so we know that the boosters tend to wane. Their, their protection starts to wear off after about three months. So this second booster is not only for people over 50, but also if it's been at least four months since your original booster. Well, the health experts are also suggesting that people who took initially the J&J &J vaccine now get a Moderna or Pfizer booster. Um, why is that? Well, unfortunately, uh, the studies have shown that the J&J &J vaccine just really doesn't perform nearly as well as the mRNA vaccines. It's important to note that this second booster authorization is only for Pfizer and Moderna, the mRNA vaccines. And new data shows that people who got the J&J &J vaccine, just the one shot, are really only 31 percent protected against hospitalization two J&Js, a little bit better, 67%. But if you combined a J&J &J shot and a booster uh, with an mRNA boost, a booster, that jumps up to about 78 to 80%. So people who are under the age of 50, if you got a J&J, &J, you are also eligible for an mRNA booster. Well, new vaccines are coming that supposedly target all the new variants. I, I think we're going to run out of uh, the Greek alphabet pretty soon. <laughs> and, and we're, so are, are we in a, a, a future where we're going to have to get booster shots every six months, every year uh, to, to combat the new variant? Well, the FDA is actually meeting next week to decide what their booster strategy is going to be. And most experts say that more than likely this fall, we'll, we will, it, they will recommend that we receive a COVID shot. Now, in the meantime, scientists are working on a new and improved COVID vaccine. Boy, we really need it. One that better protects us and also lasts longer. And so they're working on that. They're testing these new vaccines. Vaccines, and we should see the results of those uh, in May, beginning in May. So fingers crossed on that one, Gordon. Okay. Well, Lori, thanks for keeping us updated. Thanks. Well, let's turn to Europe, where there's finally some good news for religious freedom. Ephraim Graham has more on that story from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, a Finland court dismissed all charges of hate speech against a Christian member of parliament and a pastor. Those charges were filed after they shared what the Bible says about homosexuality. Dale Hurd has the story. On trial were Finnish lawmaker and former Interior Minister Paivi Rosinen and Bishop Johanna Poyola of the Evangelical Lutheran Mission. Also on trial was the Bible itself and whether quoting the Bible is a hate crime. Finland's own constitution instructs the state church to proclaim the truths of the Bible. But when Paivi Rosinen challenged the church to do just that, she was charged with a crime. Prosecutors accused Rosinen of committing hate speech on three occasions. In a pamphlet about biblical marriage published almost 20 years ago, in a broadcast interview and in a 2019 tweet in which she questioned why the state Lutheran Church was officially supporting Finland's Gay Pride Week. In my tweet, I directly cited Romans first chapter and verses 24 to 27 and posted a picture. A passage which condemns homosexuality. 
It's biblical teaching that the Finnish Constitution says it supports. The Lutheran pastor who published the pamphlet Paivi wrote on Christian marriage was also found not guilty. Rosanin says she does not regret the ordeal she's had to go through, saying she's received letters from homosexuals who accepted Christ after reading about her story. Her trial has also helped awaken many Christians in Finland who rallied to her defense. I have a very, very strong feeling that this has been my calling. In some way, this has been hard time, but in some way, I have felt that this has been a privilege. <laughs> Dale Hurd, CBN News. We turn now to the latest in the war in Ukraine. Russia says it will reduce combat operations around Kyiv and the northern city of Cheriv. This follows a round of peace talks in Turkey. However, more explosions occurred just outside of the capital overnight. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is asking his citizens to stay on high alert, saying you can trust only concrete results. The Pentagon confirms Russian troops are pulling away from Kyiv, but suspect they're moving into position for more attacks in the east. Our assessment is that uh, their intention is to reposition forces and bolster their efforts elsewhere. The peace talks are expected to resume. Ukraine has offered to remain a neutral state, meaning it won't join NATO in exchange for security guarantees. Meanwhile, more than four million Ukrainians have left the country. When the war came to her city, one Ukrainian mom made the desperate decision to take her children and flee. When she crossed into Poland, her family received a warm welcome and comfort from Operation Blessing. When the war started, at first it was just around us in Kharkiv and in big cities. We just heard something from afar. I didn't see the need to leave my homeland. Then an artillery shell hit our street. For Ksenia and her kids, the danger continued to increase. Two power poles fell and our electricity went out. For three days we didn't have lights or communication. Houses on neighboring streets began to burn, and an artillery shell hit the house next to ours. The war came to our city. As Ksenia watched the war unfold, her main concern was keeping her children safe. It's scary because I'm going into the unknown. And when you have small kids, it's very hard. All I wanted was to leave because of the explosions and bombs. The noise was terrifying. Ksenia made the difficult trek to the Polish border, where she was met by a team from Operation Blessing. We partnered with the local church to provide Ksenia and her children with a warm and quiet space to rest on their journey, safe from the violence in their home country. Right after we crossed the border, without any doubt, we knew there would be someone there to help us. But we did not know that the whole world is praying for Ukraine. So many people care about us, and we are also praying. Thanks to our donors, Operation Blessing teams are on the ground in Poland, helping refugee families like Ksenia's on their journey. I am very grateful for such support and care. It is so needed, and we love you for it. We love you, and the world is indeed praying for Ukraine. Gordon. Yes, and we're also helping very tangibly, and you can be a part of that. You can be a part of the relief effort on the border of Poland. Uh, we're also reaching out to other centers. If we can get the Orphan's Promise map, you can see all the places where Orphan's Promise has been working, and these are established centers. Uh, these aren't startups right now. We need to get them the supplies that they need. You can see on the border of Poland, there's our main warehouse. Uh, we're actually shipping supplies from that warehouse back into Ukraine, as well as hel helping the flood of refugees that are coming across the Polish border. Uh, we're looking to open new efforts in Romania, uh, Moldova, Hungary, Croatia, uh, and it's all made possible because people like you care enough to give. So if you'd like to be a part of it, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. 
You can text OB Crisis to 71777, or you can just go to our website, cbn.com. There's a place where you can designate your gift to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. Do it now. Be a part of helping those in such desperate need. 1 800 700 7000. Ashley. Well, coming up next, Shannon Bream gives voice to the mothers and daughters of the Bible. The Fox News host tells us what we can learn from their stories. And later, the star of the 90s hits All That and Keenan and Kel. Kel Mitchell reveals his favorite role, and it's not the one you think. He'll join us live later on today's show. Франківську не дуже страшно, бо там дуже підірвали аеропорт. Homes destroyed. All days they bombs uh, our town all days. Families torn apart. Да, остався муж, остались мої родители. Women and children fleeing for their lives. It, it was very... Will you help? You can be a part of distributing hygiene kits, bottled water, food, and more to the Ukrainian refugees. The needs are enormous, but you can be a part of the solution. Give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. Today, you can make a difference. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to ob.org slash crisis. Tomorrow. I would wake up and be deadly tired. A body fails for three years. I'm like, forget it, just let me die. Then came the diagnosis. That really hurt. ALS. Oh my gosh, it's gonna get worse than it already is. How he stared down a death sentence and walked away completely healed. That's the moment I knew Jesus was real. Tomorrow. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Shannon Bream is the host of Fox News at Night. She's also the author of The Women of the Bible Speak. And now she's released a follow-up to that bestseller, The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak. Well, CBN's Jenna Browder has more. What does it mean to have faith? Shannon Bream explores that in her newest book, Through the Beautiful Lens of Mothers and Daughters. There are certainly truths all throughout the book that I think will be encouraging to people. The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak follows up on the success of her last book, The Women of the Bible Speak, a number one New York Times bestseller. So talk a little bit about that and, and then also what led you to write this new book. You know, I think that there was a real hunger and thirst, especially during the pandemic, which is when the first book was written in the real early days when there was so much we didn't know. People felt isolated. They were fearful. Many of them were out of their churches and kind of at home. And I think it was one of those books that it was just full of encouragement and inspiration. And that's this one, too. If you think about finances and family and infertility and all of these different things that women faced, um, they just really translated. So we knew there were still a lot of strong female stories in the Bible that hadn't been told or needed to be elaborated on. So we said, all right, let's plunge into these mother-daughter relationships. One not so easy task, choosing who to include. I think sometimes there are easy, obvious ones like Mary, the mother of Jesus and in the Old Testament telling of Esther. I think that there are some characters that just jump out at you that have had um, really big impact. Their stories have been known over time, even for people who don't really know the Bible, they have some interest or some knowledge of their stories. And then others, I think I try, I try to choose ones that really resonate with me. Some of these are really small stories where we don't even have the name of the woman involved, but maybe there was a miracle or we really saw God's work in their lives when they were desperate and needed him to show up. Among her favorites. You know, I, I have a little place in my heart for all of them. I think they're all special and beautiful. I love the initial story that we have of Jochebed and Miriam, who are the mother of Moses and the sister of Moses, because we have not just one, but two strong, brave women in this story. And I love how we see them work together as mother and daughter too. Moses and Miriam, both critical in the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land none of which would have been possible without Jacobed's bravery to float her son down the river. 
One theme throughout the book is the intimate connection between faith and family. And so many of these stories, too, are people who may not be related by blood, but they become chosen or found family, which I think is all of us coming into the body of Christ, being adopted in. And I love the picture of that. Think Naomi and Ruth, the mother and daughter-in-law duo. As Shannon points to her own mother as inspiration. I was really blessed to grow up with a mom who was a bit of a baby Christian um, when I was little, too. And we almost kind of grew together in that she is the best example I know in my life of somebody who's truly Christ-like. I mean, hands and feet, showing up, not just saying, I'll pray for you and forgetting about it five minutes later. I mean, she's on her knees before the sun comes up, praying for people. If you're on her list, it's actually happening. She's the first one to show up when you have a tragedy, if you need a casserole, if you've had a baby, if you're in the hospital. I mean, my mom is the very living embodiment of what we should be, I think, as Christians, respecting other people, whether we agree or disagree with them politically or any other way. I mean, seeing them as God's creation and somebody who is worthy of his, his love and his mercy, the grace he's extended to us, and then we then um, you know, model that and give that to other people in our lives. So I've always had a really strong example in my mom, and I'm always telling her, when I grow up one day, I want to be more like you. Um, really, she's reflecting Christ, um, but I'd love to be more like her as well. If there's one message she hopes readers take away from this book. I hope it's encouragement. I really hope that will draw them to God to see that he is for you in your family squabbles, in your high moments, in your low moments, um, when you've made bad decisions or good decisions. I mean, he is always present in your life. We see that in these women thousands of years ago, and we know it's true today that we can see the evidence of that. So know that Um, He came to save, not to condemn, but to give you his overwhelming love, his salvation. And he's just waiting for you to come to him. And the book also includes study questions for each chapter, making it a great study of sorts to do with family and friends. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, Shannon Bream's book is called The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible. You can find it wherever books are sold. Ashley? Cal Mitchell was just 15 years old when he got his start in Hollywood. And if you've watched documentaries on child stars, you can probably guess what happened next. For a season of his life, Cal battled depression, addiction, and even suicidal thoughts until he learned to live in the blessed mode. Cal Mitchell became famous in the 90s with Nickelodeon comedies All That and Kenan and Cal. He went on to write, produce, direct, and earn two Emmy nominations in acting. In recent years, Kells put his Christian faith at the forefront. A youth pastor at Spirit Food Christian Center, he encourages youth every week to love God and follow their dreams. In his new book, Blessed Mode, Kell recounts his struggle with depression and addiction and shares how to find freedom in God's presence. All right. Well, Kel Mitchell joins us now via Skype. Kel, welcome to the 700 Club. <laughs> hey, how are you? <laughs> Good. We are so blessed to have you. And I'm, I'm such a fan. I remember back in the day watching all that. So I'm happy to talk to you this morning. Oh, thank you. Happy to have, talk to you, too. <laughs> all right. Well, your life has uh, seen incredible highs and some pretty low lows to the point where you started feeling suicidal at one point. What was going on with you during that time? Yeah, you know, I had uh, I had been through a lot, you know what I mean, uh, throughout my life, uh, dealing with a lot of different uh, emotional walls uh, within my life, uh, a lot of ups and downs. And I feel like uh, there was a point where the enemy was just tempting me to say, hey, you could just end your life right now uh, and don't have to deal with any of these struggles or deal with any of this stress. Uh, but I'm glad I decided to live. And uh, a lot of a lot of people are dealing with a lot of stress, and a lot of people are dealing with a lot of anxiety, uh, especially now. And uh, mental health is so serious. And so uh, it's important to me to uh, let people know to replace those negative thoughts uh, and thinking uh, godly thoughts, and just really focusing on God and knowing that you are beautifully and wonderfully made by God, and we are all made for a purpose. And uh, yeah, and so for me, that is just something that I love to promote and let other people know because I want everybody to live. And uh, if I would have done that, um, I would have not seen all the blessings and, and things and triumphs that I've gotten through. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we've seen so many child actors struggle later in life, but here you are living your best life. How has your faith played a role in that? 
Oh, a very big part. <laughs> a, a very big part. Uh, I no longer think of uh, just me, you know? Uh, I, I now live life very transparent. <clears throat> I live life for God. Um, I want people to see the God in me. And I realize that with everything I do with a uh, job, career, uh, family, life, all these different things, I'm meeting everybody for a reason because we are all part of God's family. Uh, so it's no longer about me and what Kel is doing or Kel mode. It's more of the blessed mode is really saying it's about God. <laughs> I want you to see the God in me. <laughs> yeah. And amen to that. Well, tell us about your book, Blessed Mode. What's the meaning behind that name, Blessed Mode? And what inspired you to write it? Bless mode. So uh, bless mode is really uh, getting into a mode every day. Uh, you know, when we wake up, we need to renew our mind daily. And so what this does is uh, it empowers you. It gets you ready for your day because we all go through the fields uh, every day. Like a lot of things can come up. A lot of things can come up as far as trouble, anxiety, stress. And we can go to bed with that, thinking about that. And what this does is that when you wake up in the morning, uh, you spend time with God. And when you spend time with him, you're saying, Lord, I prepare for my day. I want to react in love to no matter what comes up in my life. And I wrote this book to show people how to do that, you know, if, and how to have a relationship with God and put him into every aspect of your life. So it works on your mental health, your physical health, and your spiritual health as well. Uh, so I might have you forgive someone in this book. I have a lot of call to actions in this book as well. Uh, and I might have you do an exercise as well in this book. So uh, it's just an awesome book to get you ready for your day and motivate you. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Well, there's a saying that you've repeated. I'm a masterpiece trying to master peace. What do you mean by that? Oh, yes. Uh, that right there is literally telling people that you were made for a purpose. You were made great when God knitted you in your mother's womb, right? So you are a masterpiece, meaning that God designed you. He put you together, right? So, uh, and as you go through this world and things come up, a lot of times we forget that. And the enemy wants us to forget that, oh, we are a child of God. We can do amazing things. Things are very possible. Dreams are possible. Uh, but if we just focus on what's going on in the natural, uh, we can forget that. And I want people to have faith and really understand that these, these ideas, this love, these blessings that God gives us are, are can all be manifested and can actually happen within your life. So master the peace. Have the peace of God and to worry less and be a warrior, not a worrier. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, you mentioned that out of all the projects you've done, you say that your favorite role has been that of a youth pastor. Why is that? I love being a youth pastor. Uh, I love uh, hearing stories uh, from uh, my teenagers that I, I minister to. Uh, and it's beautiful to see uh, God working within their life. Uh, and when they pray and I pray with them and I see uh answered prayer happen for their life and for their family. Uh, that's so important to me. I think like even within the Bible, uh, there's so many stories of triumph and faith and uh, people getting through different obstacles in their lives. And uh, I want to be that for uh, the kids to let them know you can do this too. You can, you can make it. You can get through whatever you're going through. And uh, to see them get through things in their life that they've been dealing with uh, as a team uh, is such a wonderful thing. <laughs> I love what God is doing with your life, Kellen. I love that you're a youth pastor now and you're speaking to the youth. You've been doing that for years. So you can hear more of Kel's story in his brand new devotional book. It's called Blessed Mode and it's available stores nationwide. Kel, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you. God bless you. Thanks for having me. God bless you. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson has picked up a key vote for her confirmation to the U.S. Supreme Court. Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine plans to vote yes. It's widely believed Jackson has the nomination locked up with support from all 50 Democratic senators, but the administration is working to get Republican support to emphasize the historic significance of the first black woman nominated to the high court. Jackson's confirmation vote could come as early as next Friday. 
Another historic moment at the White House Tuesday, President Joe Biden signing the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act into law, making lynching a federal hate crime. The law is named for Emmett Till, a black teenager who was beaten and shot to death in Mississippi in 1955 after being accused of whistling at a white woman. His death remains a symbol of racial violence against African Americans. His family was on hand for the signing of the legislation. The Equal Justice Initiative documented nearly 6,500 lynchings in the United States between 1865 and 1950. I'd like to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Now, Jean is a widow and raising six children by herself. On good days, she earned $2 working a back-breaking job. On bad days, she had no money to feed her family. This is the river where 46-year-old Najin usually worked after her husband died a few years ago. We worked collecting sand and rocks from the river for construction materials. I have six children, three daughters and three sons. As a widow, Najin now takes care of her six children alone. On average, I only earn about one or two dollars a day. It was really hard for me to provide for my children. There have been times when Najin has not been able to sell the material she collected to construction companies. In her desperation, she said prayer was her only hope. I always prayed and believed that one day Jesus would change our situation. I said, God, whatever your plan is for me and my children, I surrender everything in your hands. I believe you will take care of us. This is 11-year-old Smart, Najin's youngest son. I remember one day we did not have any rice to eat, only fried bananas. Also, there was another day I wanted to eat chicken, but mom said she did not have money to buy any. SMART was part of an after-school program near their home, which is supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. When we learned about their situation, we decided to help by giving Najin capital to start a grocery business in their home. I used the funds from Orphan's Promise to buy food and other items based on what people need here most in our village. Orphan's Promise also helped me to open a mini gas station in front of my shop, which I used to fill motorcycle tanks. We went to visit Najin a few months later, and she said the business has continued to grow. From the profit I earned, I was able to add even more items into my grocery store. Now that she has the grocery shop, mom buys us chicken, fish, and vegetables to eat. I am so grateful to our Lord Jesus because through Orphan's Promise, He has changed our lives. You're a part of that if you're a member of the 700 Club. If you're not a member and want to help people around the world, whether that's in Ukraine or in Indonesia, uh, we're working on your behalf around the world to help people and to be very tangible help to them, to give them the dignity of earning their own income the dignity that comes with knowing that you can control your financial future, you're not helpless, that there are people who want to help you, not with a handout, but with a hand up, so that you can enjoy the benefits of earning your own income. It's wonderful what happens when we all get together and say, yes, let's do something. Let's do something good for people, and let's do it around the world. If that's you, join with us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. Some of you can join at higher levels. So we have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month, 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. At whatever level, do it now, 1-800-700-7000. And when you call and join at any, at any one of those levels, it's our gift to you my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit. Um, you'll understand the miraculous power of God. We'll send you a copy, and then you'll get an instant ebook ac access. I want you to have it. Uh, it's yours when you call and join. 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? These days, Elizabeth is at work helping victims of sex trafficking. It's an issue close to her heart, 
because not long ago, she was a victim herself. I just wanted the, the inner, the um, eternal, like the pain inside to go away. Like I was just um, craving that attention and, um, and craving somebody to just be like, okay, it's gonna be okay, but I wasn't getting that. What Elizabeth Hitos was getting instead was physical abuse from her family. It started when she was four, after her parents divorced and she went to live with her mom. It lasted for years. Eventually I thought it was no more growing up, that being beaten was part of, you know, part of a relationship or part of something that a child goes through. I tried to reach out for help and I wasn't heard. And so it, it just kind of showed me that I wasn't loved, I was unlovable. In addition to the abuse at home, Elizabeth was bullied and beaten up at school. So at 10, she turned to cutting. Because I, I was so empty inside and I was angry and I was hurting and I was finding ways to cope. Although she went to church, she had no use for God. To Elizabeth, God was uncaring and vengeful. If he's really here and he has your back and he loves you and he cares about you, then why is this happening at home? You know, so I couldn't understand. And I don't want to serve that type of God. At 14, Elizabeth decided she'd had enough and ran away to live with her dad. What I was hoping to get being with my dad was love, protection. Um, I thought I was going to get an instant gratification and, and get that fulfillment and be happy, but it wasn't like that. After just a few months, the now 15-year-old left home again. This time, she dropped out of school and moved in with a 27-year-old man she had met, who showered her with compliments and attention. I felt like that he was going to be there and take care of me. I thought it was what I needed from this man. And so I fell over heels for him, like I was in love with him. He turned out to be a drug dealer who used Elizabeth in his drug business. He also got her hooked on meth. I did feel like I was wanted at some degree, but it was kind of like I was already starting to get numb. I didn't know what I want, you know, because I was so lost. Life would only get worse. A year later, the man ended up in prison on drug charges. Soon after, a woman showed up to run the man's drug business. She also had something else in mind, force Elizabeth into prostitution. I didn't have any worth at all. Like every time I got in these cars with these men, I had to check out. It's like I had to disattach, I had to disassociate so I can leave my body and, and, and go through what I was going through. For the next 10 years, Elizabeth was living on the streets, making money any way she could and trying to stay high. She was in and out of jail a few times, yet nothing inspired her to change. I was dying inside. I was dying and I didn't feel like I was human, like I was loved. Then at 26, she got pregnant and had a son. However, even being a mom wasn't enough to change her behavior. In October of 2011, Elizabeth was arrested for selling drugs. She was sentenced to five years and lost custody of her son. When I lost my son, um, due to my last arrest, I started to wake up. I started to wake up. Um, I started to feel my emotions because I was loaded all those years. I started to realize that I, you know, missed my son. You know, um, that I have this baby that saved, saved me, basically. Sober and alone, Elizabeth knew she needed to change. She reached out to Brother Marty, a pastor who regularly visited the inmates. So that's my first experience with somebody just loving me like how Jesus would, you know, like how Jesus does, because he was hearing me and not, with no judgment, with no putting me down, calling me names. He was hearing me and hearing the pain I was going through. I needed somebody to hear me at that time, somewhere where I felt safe. I felt really safe with him. She started attending Bible studies and kept meeting with Brother Marty. Soon, Elizabeth developed a new understanding of God and started to see herself differently. And I started to love myself more. Like even though loving yourself, especially with that type of background, it takes a while. It really helped me put my guard down. Elizabeth earned her GED and was released to a woman's recovery program. There, she learned that the abuse and sexual trafficking was not her fault. She learned to forgive herself and others and continued growing closer to God. And I felt this complete peace. Um, and I felt like a supernatural awakening, like God's got so many plans for me. You know, so I started to believe it. I started to have my own relationship with him. I was starting to feel his, like really feel him. Elizabeth surrendered her life to God, and in 2015, 
she was baptized. Then in 2018, after two years of fighting, she received a governor's pardon for her past convictions. So that's like true redemption. I felt like I was being given a second chance and like my everything from my past is being erased completely. And so um, it was a miracle for that to happen for me. Today, Elizabeth is happily married, earned a bachelor's degree, and has regained full custody of her son. She runs a safe house for trafficking victims and has found the love she always wanted. I know God loves me unconditionally. Like, totally, I know he loves me. He shows me all the time. For a long time, you know, um, I've worked with my, me my mentors around letting go of condemnation because I will feel so much condemnation, but that's because of my past. I do feel protection. I do feel safe because I know at the end of the day that he's going to make sure everything works out. Amen. Praise God. I love that story. You can see Elizabeth's passion for Jesus because she had a true encounter with the living God. Her heart opened up to let Jesus in. And once she did, you see it. She was transformed from the inside out. You know, scripture tells us that God forgives us of our sins, but he goes even beyond that. And he says, I will forget them. If you have come to the Lord in the past, if you've had a salvation experience, but you've fallen short, as we all do, we all fall short of the glory of God. And somehow the sin that you've been dabbling in has, has separated you from him and you've walked away from him and you think that you're too dirty, that you've done too many bad things that God could never forgive you and he could never love you again. Friend, I'm here to tell you that that is a lie from the pit of hell. It is a lie sent to you to make you think that God doesn't love you and that he won't welcome you home again. The truth is he is waiting for you to come home. He's waiting with open arms for you to come home and run back to him so he can hug you and embrace you and put a ring on your finger just like the prodigal son, that beautiful story that Jesus told. It's true. It is a true representation of our heavenly father. I want to encourage you today. If you're in that spot and you're feeling like the Lord doesn't love you, come to Jesus. Come back to the Lord again, friend. He will cleanse you. He will make you new. Just let your guard down and let the King of Kings reign in your heart and in your mind and in your soul and your spirit. I'm here to encourage you today that you are safe with Jesus. You're safe with him. You can trust him with the deepest and darkest, darkest parts of your soul. He's a good, good father, and there's a hope and a future for you. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I welcome you into my heart, whether it'll be the first time or you're doing it again. Welcome him today. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you, my savior, my redeemer. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry for walking away from you. I'm sorry for putting my guard up and not letting you in. I'm sorry for the doubt and the fear that I've had towards you. Forgive me of that, Father. Today I choose to walk away from that life of sin and death. And today I choose you. I choose you, Jesus. Come into my heart, make me new. I believe that you died on the cross for me and for my sins and that you resurrected three days later. And that same resurrection power, it lives in me. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in my life. I choose you. I choose to walk with you and talk with you and have an intimate relationship with you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters who just prayed that prayer, God. I just pray for a baptism of your love right now to flow over them, God transform their minds, their hearts, make them new, Jesus. In your name, we ask and believe all of this. Amen.
and amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer with me, please do one more thing. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We've got amazing free resources for you that are going to help you along this new faith journey. Gordon? We're ready for some email questions. Let's go. Let's do this. All right. Are you so ready with all the answers? Uh -huh. This is for you to answer. <laughs> All right, this is Carol. This is a good one. My family and I were discussing the prosperity gospel, mm. and we're wondering if it is biblical. We heard it said, according to this gospel, that the more faith you have, the more blessed you will be. Thank you for shedding some light on this subject. Okay, I think prosperity gospel has become sort of a tagline uh, anytime uh, anyone in ministry talks about the benefits of tithing. Mm. And so it, it, it's it's become this sort of critical thing that, you know, well, you're just teaching prosperity gospel. Uh, there's a continuum here, a, a spectrum, if you will. Uh, for a long time in Christian history, it was somehow thought that if you took a vow of poverty, that made you holy. Mm -hmm. And uh, within the Protestant Reformation uh, and the, the Protestant work ethic and the whole concept of a secular calling, that was equal to a religious calling, that you didn't have to go become a priest or a nun in order to serve God. You can serve God through your work, and God would bless that. Um, there's a whole sociological study uh, about the Protestant work ethic and what that does to cultures, that when you apply hard work and, and you're doing your work unto God and you view it as a calling, that God would bless that. And so you see that in the Protestant cultures of Western Europe, and particularly here in North America. It's the, the principle that has made America so great uh, and has led to so much prosperity in our country. There's nothing holy about being desperately poor. At the same time, there's not anything holy about being extravagantly rich. So what's the purpose of the prosperity that God wants to give his children is so that we can help others. The purpose of ha having money is so that you can do wonderful good things for other people. When you have that alignment and you can, instead of on one end, I'm going to have a vow of poverty, I'm going to prove to myself how holy I am because I'm going to starve every day. <laughs> And the other, I'm going to have the Bentley and the huge McMansion, and the more cars I have, it, it proves just how holy I am. No, both extremes are absolutely wrong. It's in that middle. What does God want you to do today? What is your calling in Him? How does He want you to be used to help other people? It's the most spiritual thing you can ever do. Help somebody else. Amen. Here's a word from Proverbs. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.